Welcome to the 2023 edition of Trieste Next. I'm Luca, an AI-generated speaker who will presenting our festival. In the next three days we will be talking about a new world. This is the title of the 12th edition of our Festival of Science. Innovation and Research, the ethical limits and new frontiers of science will be the center of all our events. What will the new world be like? Will we be able to face the challenges of the near future applying new scientific discoveries and technologies in a sustainable way? This will be the underlying theme of Trieste Next, with 100 events in English and Italian, the Science Book of the Year Literary Award, 300 speakers, 70 activities for schools and 40 exhibition spaces that are open for everybody in the city center close to the town hall. Before leaving the floor to our next panelists, I would like to thank all the scientific institutions within the Trieste City of Knowledge Network, the main partner together with our content partners and sponsors for supporting our project. Mostly, thank you to the 200 volunteers who are helping us. I have one last remark for all of you. The next event will last 75 minutes. Our speakers will answer all of your questions in the final 15 minutes. Also, please remember to check the updated schedule of events on our website. Thank you and enjoy our festival. Okay. So, let me thank you all of you to be oh, what <laughs> to be present. Uh, to this uh, conference this morning. I'm Gabriele Bai. I'm a professor at the University of Trieste and I'm currently also involved in the um, inter Interdepartmental Center for Advanced Microscopy and we propose uh, this uh, conference on the uh, challenges that we will all face in the terms of research for the, first, the 21st century. Uh, I will uh, present you uh, all the speaker. We have uh, Professor Cesca from the University of Trieste, uh, Professor of Physiology at the University of Trieste. Uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Salinas uh, from uh, INSERM um, um, Marseille, France, Montpellier, pardon, Montpellier, Montpellier, France. And we have uh, uh, the researcher uh, Matteo uh, Rossi, Sebastiano, uh, from University of Torino. All of us uh, will present, uh, will have a brief presentation right now, about 10 minutes, 12 minutes long. After this, uh, we will uh, be open uh, all the discussion that maybe will last more than 15 minutes that the AI generated guy suggests us. And uh, we will, uh, so we will reply to all possible curiosity and uh, to, our, to the best of our knowledge. So for the moment, I will make uh, start uh, Professor Salinas. Thank you to be here. And let's start with her. Thank you. Bonjour, hello everybody. I'm going to, to keep in English. If there are words that you don't understand because my ac French accent is, uh, is bad, don't hesitate to, to stop me. Uh, I will gladly uh, try to, to repeat. Um, obviously, when one talks about uh, challenges for the, this century and the next, the brain is uh, a key organ to understand and to treat. And what I will try to do in this small talk is present you briefly and generally some of the challenges that uh, are currently uh, on the treatment of brain diseases. Okay, so I will start really briefly uh, to tell you that unfortunately brain diseases are touching uh, a lot of people. In Europe, it is uh, thought that around 165 million of people are currently suffering from brain diseases. And one can imagine that one of three people during the course of their life will have a brain disease. Uh, so on, the, on, oops, excuse me, on this panel, you can see the main category, uh, categories of brain diseases. So it can be uh, cancer, it can be uh, during traumati traumatisms or uh, neurogenerative diseases. And we know now that, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, this total burden of neurological diseases is increasing. It's increasing because we are facing an aging society. People live longer, live better, but the longer you live, the more prone you are to to, to have diseases, and especially uh, brain diseases. And this uh, is quite different around the world, depending where you live, how you live, 
uh, if you have access to uh, uh, medical care easily or not, if you are around uh, environment that can be also toxic, like with pesticides. So it's very different uh, around the world. And here is just the list of the main brain diseases, and you can see that most of you already know uh, most of them. And what is uh, quite uh, evident is that uh, there are different causes on, on those diseases. Not of all of the causes are known. What we know is that most of the time there are multifactorial causes to this brain disease. And this is really important to, to understand and to know because this is one of the main challenges in treating brain diseases that often the cause uh, are different and we have always to uh, have a, a multi, uh, multi uh, um, disciplinary approach to, tra to treat some of those diseases. So, uh, what are the, the main challenges uh, for uh, treating brain diseases? So, like any other organ, you can see that uh, there are key features for the drugs uh, to be efficient that need to, re to be respected, such as stability, selective targeting, the, uh, the non-toxicity of the drug, and uh, also the, the, the long treatment uh, that uh, is often needed. Um, when one think about the brain, uh, the first uh, question that we ask is how we reach the brain. And this is where I will try to focus a little bit now because uh, one has to know that the brain is physically separated from the bloodstream by a, a structure that is called the blood-brain barrier here. And this is really a key, the key feature uh, when one thing about uh, targeting the brain, the brain with a, a specific drug. It has to reach the brain through the blood-brain barrier. So uh, this structure was first uh, shown at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the, uh, of the 20th by researcher that uh, did a very simple experiment that was inject a blue dye in the bloodstream of, uh, of animals either mouse or hamster, uh, rodents basically, and what they found is that most of the, all of the organs were able to take up this dye and become blue, uh, except the brain that remain, uh, remain uh, its natural color, it didn't get blue. And this was the first evidence of a physical barrier that uh, select selectively uh, filter what is in the bloodstream uh, so that the brain is not uh, um, put in danger by toxins or pathogens that are uh, circulating in the bloodstream. Doesn't mean that it never gets in the brain, but at least there is a specific structure that uh, its main role is to protect the brain from the environment that is uh, in the blood. Uh, if we zoom a little bit more, and I won't go too much into details, what is important to know is that this uh, barrier is uh, actually just, if I may say, a single layer of cells. They are endothelial cells, and their property is that they are able to form what we call an endothelium uh, by uh, interacting with each other in a very uh, strong manner, so basically, only very small, sorry, it's a bit confusing, only very small molecules are able to pass uh, throughout the, those cells, and big molecules or uh, organelles or cells will have to have been selected through evolution to have specific mechanisms that allow them to cross. Uh, otherwise, they are not allowed physically to cross this barrier. And obviously, this will be uh, the key point for any drugs that one wants to, for instance, inject intravenously. Uh, obviously, I talked about this barrier as a, this uh, structure as a barrier, but it also has a role in regulating the homeostasis of the brain. And one has to know that the brain is one of the most uh, uh, vascularized structures, so there's really a, a, a lot of blood vessels in the brain because for most of us, this is a, a, an organ that is a, a strongly uh, functioning and that needs a lot of blood supply. 
and it's uh, thought that there is around 160,000 kilometers of vasculature in the brain. And because it's important, it's also, unfortunately, a target, uh, or at least uh, impaired in uh, many brain diseases. So one has to think about this barrier as uh, uh, an obstacle for drug delivery, but also a target for, to treat certain of, the, uh, of those diseases. So it's really a key feature when one talks about brain biology. I won't go into too much details, but w just to let you know that, as I said, this is the, the obstacle for drug delivery because it is a highly selective barrier. And as I mentioned, there are different mechanisms that naturally exist for molecules or even cells, for instance, cells of the immune system to cross this barrier. So for instance, very small molecules can pass between cells or can recognize a cell receptor uh, on the blood side that will allow them to be transported in different ways uh, from the blood to the brain and also some uh, specific protein such as albumin that is natur naturally crossing the, the barrier. And when scientists and clinicians had to think about how to deliver drugs in the brain, obviously they didn't want to reinvent uh, warm water. I don't know if you say that in English, in French, it's a, a common expression to say that, let, yeah, don't reinvent the wheel. Let's take mechanisms that are naturally existing and try to target drugs to use those mechanisms. So here is just an example of the main uh, biotechnological um, ways to uh, deliver drugs. So you can have, for instance, um, liposomes that are lipid, uh, sometimes bilayer lipid uh, vesicles that can be loaded with a specific drug that are known to uh, naturally cross. You can have, uh, and I will come to that a little bit later, nanotechnology such as gold nanoparticle. And you can also have uh, what is called biomass derived material such, of, such as, for instance, viral vector. So vectors derived from viruses that are known to directly uh, infect the brain by their ability to cross this barrier. So there are two basically main uh, ways to think about drug delivery, using uh, something that is already using this pathway and redirecting it so to, to add the drugs or uh, creating because one has to know the physical and biophysical properties of molecules to cross this barrier and recreating such, such molecules to, to be able to cross. And the last thing uh, that I will mention a bit briefly is that you can also try to selecti selectively uh, disrupt uh, temporarily the barriers to open it a little bit and to force drug delivery. So um, one uh, key, uh, one key uh, technology that is uh, currently using is what we call nanoparticles. So it's a word that uh, actually uh, means a lot of different uh, approaches, but the idea is really to have uh, a particle that is loaded with the drug of interest, and that will be designed uh, for their ability to either target a specific receptor or because of its, bio, its biophysic uh, uh, component will be able to directly uh, be absorbed by the barrier to target the, the brain. So uh, you can see that, uh, for instance, the transferrin receptor that is highly expressed on endothelial cells is often found uh, uh, coupled to some of these uh, nanoparticles. Um, another area that has been uh, really studied over the last few decades are gene therapy and viral vector. And when one talk about the brain, uh, we all, all, all often uh, talk about those vectors, the adeno-associated viruses vectors, that have been uh, removed from their viral uh, genes that are encoding the, uh, the, the virulence, the toxicity associated with the virus and replaced by the therapeutic transgenes. 
And a lot of uh, brain disease are currently in clinic clinical trial using these viruses, sorry, these vectors derived from these uh, viruses because some type of uh, adeno-associated viruses have the ability to naturally cross the blood-brain barrier. So this is a way to, uh, uh, to bring a transgene into the brain. The other way also, uh, one has to think that uh, direct injection to the brain is possible. It's something that is it's, uh, routinely done in surgery by stereotactic uh, injection. And this can be also, in this case, a way to specifically and, uh, uh, bring, uh, bring these uh, adenovirus vectors uh, into the brain. And to finish, I wanted just to focus a little bit on the way to open uh, the blood-brain barrier by ultrasound, which is a technique now that has been, uh, that has been shown uh, repeatedly to be quite uh, well to tolerated by patients. And basically, it's quite simple. So micro bubbles uh, are injected in the bloodstream uh, of patients. And with localized um, um, ultrasound, you can, uh, because the micro bubble will start to move uh, in, the, in, the, uh, blood br in the blood, you can create small holes in the blood barrier. Really, at the site of the ultrasound, you can see here uh, the opening of the, uh, the blood-brain barrier at the site of the ultrasound, that it disappears because it's really transient. Once you remove the ultrasound machine, then uh, there's no, no more this uh, ability. And this is really a technique that is also uh, uh, in different cl clinical trials to, uh, to try to bring a maximum of, uh, of the drugs that are used in, uh, into the brain. So I will like uh, I, I will finish here by saying that, like many organs, but especially in the brain, one really has to to think about multidisciplinary approaches and techniques to target brain disease that are often still not well understood, and uh, due to multifactorial agents. So uh, I will take questions after, and I thank you for your time and. If anything, you, any question, don't hesitate to contact me after uh, the talk or later by email. I thank you. Thank you, Prof, for the fascinating uh, uh, brief lecture. And now the award goes to Professor Fabrizia Cesca. Okay, good morning everyone. Okay, that's me. So, well, first it's really a pleasure to be here. I am also a neurophysiologist, so we are gonna stay in the brain, also for my talk. Um, so, when Gabriele suggested biotechnologies <coughs> in the 21st century, <coughs> One, the first thing that came to my mind is actually the study of rare genetic disorders. That is also what I do in my own research. So I decided today to discuss a bit with you how we address this difficult uh, issue now, um, bringing as an example one disease that I am studying, which is a rare form of hereditary spastic paraplegia, so a movement disorder. Uh, so you don't see very well, but um, if you have very good eyes, uh, let's start by saying that uh, um, paraplegias are one of the most confused groups of uh, neurodegenerative and neurological disorders. And it was suggested very early that there are as many classifications of them as authors on the subject. So we start already with a problem, okay? Um, so, as mentioned before, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a biologist, so I do preclinical research on this disease. However, let me just give you just a, some basic uh, info of what it is so that we can all, you know, follow on the same, at the same pace. So, um, you can have broadly two forms of paraplegia. It can be pure, meaning um, affecting selectively 
the motility of the lower limbs, so the legs, uh, while uh, language and cognition are preserved. So patients suffer, of course, of very disabling symptoms, but they have no shortened lifespan and uh, cognitive abilities are intact. So these are the pure forms. Or you can have complex forms of HSP, and there, uh, besides the spasticity, you can also have additional symptoms affecting uh, the brain. For example, epilepsy is one common symptom, or various levels of intellectual disability, psychiatric symptoms, and so on. So in general, you can have already a very broad spectrum of uh, symptomatic manifestations <coughs> of this pathology. Um, so there are uh, genetic diseases, um, so usually they are monogenic. So as of now, we have more than 80 genes that are called spastic paraplegia or SPG genes that have been identified, but the list is continuously growing and actually the one particular gene that I am studying is one of those genes that have been added recently to the already long list. And uh, overall, you can say that two to five individuals over 100,000 worldwide are affected. So it's rare, again, with uh, big differences between different areas of the world. <clears throat> So the keyword is definitely heterogeneity because you can have very early forms that start uh, uh, children or you can be uh, forms that manifest themselves later on in life. Um, and with this, uh, so all mode of inheritance are possible, uh, autosomic, um, autosomic dominant, recessive and maternal and so on with a high phenotypic variability. So already when you study this disease, you face the first issue that the cohort of patients that you have is extremely variable um, to start with. So, and for this reason, many cases are still difficult to diagnose or especially when you have complex forms, they are misdiagnosed because maybe the, um, uh, the focus is given more to the other symptoms uh, and maybe the movement the impairment is very light. Okay, so it's a very complex pathology to start with, and besides, it's rare, okay? So this adds to the, to the problem. So, um, what, of course, there is a, a lot of effort in research since several decades. So, uh, let's take like a very small step back in general. When we uh, control voluntary movement, uh, in general, this goes through two steps. So we have the first motor neurons that start from our brain cortex and go to our spine, and that's called upper motor neuron. And then this communicates to a lower motor neuron then from the spine goes to the muscle, and that allows us to move. So that's a very brief. Uh, HSPs uh, usually mostly affect the upper motor neurons, okay, unless uh, you have some complex forms. And we know already a lot from the uh, molecular and cellular um, side. So we know, for example, the most uh, uh, genes that are mutated and that give this pathology, they actually affect a relatively small group of biological processes. For example, how um, intracellular uh, molecules and organelles are transported from the soma, which is in the spine, to the end of, uh, sorry, from the soma, in this case, in the brain, to the end of the axon, which is in the spine. So things have to travel quite a long way. And if this transport mechanism is affected, of course, the neurons in the end will die. So this is one possibility. And then other genes will affect uh, the capability of neurons to survive and to maintain them function. So we know already a lot. But also, as uh, uh, Sarah was mentioning before, genetics is fundamental for this disease, but not enough, because it is no, now also that environmental factors, uh, modifier genes uh, are also playing a role. But for rare disease, uh, this is even more difficult to, uh, to understand, because we have very few patients, so statistics is not uh, on our side, let's say. So, uh, so how do we study rare diseases uh, in general? Well, in general, many experimental models are possible. 
uh, as you can see here. Some are maybe a bit unexpected because uh, you can use, for example, C. elegans, which is a worm, or Drosophila, which is the fruit fly, or even Danioradior, which is a fish. So how can they be useful for movement disorders? Well, actually, they are very useful because they allow to perform high throughput screening on molecules that potentially may help curing the disease. Because you can use, of course, a lot of small fruit flies or a lot of worms. So you can perform large scale analysis. Then, of course, they have to verified in higher order organisms, but at least this is a way to screen, you know, a lot of compounds and to select the most promising. Uh, of course, there are uh, rodent models. We have uh, a number of transgenic mouse lines uh, that uh, mimic, uh, uh, that, sorry, that carry one or couple of genes that are known to cause the pathology. But of course, as you can imagine, um, this work is already more focused, so we cannot have hundreds and hundreds of lines of transgenic animals. This would not be feasible for several reasons, ethical reasons, uh, co costs, uh, and, and many others that if you want, we can discuss later on. Um, so what, and then there is something more, and this is what I'm gonna focus on today. So you can use uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells, uh, human-derived pluripotent stem cells, which I will address now. And then we can also have an in silico approach. Uh, for this, we keep the suspense because uh, the next speaker, uh, Matteo, will, will tell you more about this. And actually, we are collaborating on the same type of pathology, so you can see both approaches to, uh, to the disease. Uh, so let's focus on these pluripotent stem cells. But first, let me tell you what is the rare gene that I'm working on, super briefly. So I'm working on this gene that is calling, called Kidins220 since uh, now all my scientific life, I can say. Uh, I did many preclinical studies using some of the models that I explained to you before. So we know a lot about what this protein does in normal condition. We know that it participates to neuronal growth and survival and plasticity. Recently, well recently, let's say in relatively recently in 2016, there was the first report associating mutations in the human gene for kidneys to 20 to a rare form of spastic paraplegia. So here you see the first three patients reported were three children, unrelated, okay? They carried different mutations in the gene um, and they displayed the spastic paraplegia as a main symptom, but also intellectual disability, nystagmus, nystagmus which is a disorder of the eye movement, and obesity. Uh, so it is a complex form of paraplegia, not just the movement disorder. And this was named CINO, okay, as an acronym from these three patients. Uh, after this first report, uh, several more where I listed them here, but now we know of about few tens of patients uh, carrying this same pathology in the literature. So how can we study that? I know the protein very well, I know what it does. What can we do to match uh, what we have in the preclinical data to you know, to help these people. So I will mention two uh, approaches. First, uh, what we can do with molecular studies with, with human models, so pluripotent stem cells. And second, the very important part of this, which is the collaboration actually with the patients themselves and the clinicians. So let's start from this second. So this is true for all diseases, but for race diseases, this is especially true. Uh, and I mean uh, connected with the families of, and the patients themselves. So in this case, uh, there was a, um, uh, a family in the States and the mom um, with the affected uh, child created a Facebook community. They are much better than us in doing these things, I should say. Created a Facebook community, she browsed PubMed, she found me and contacted me asking me, so I'm trying to collect all the people with the same uh, pathology, can you help? That was, of course, ha very happy to help. So now this community is, uh, has grown a lot, and I should say that every patient that is now diagnosed with this specific gene, which is a very unknown gene, you know, the first thing you do is go Google, and you find the Facebook page. So all, well, 
I cannot say for sure that all the patients are there, but many, many patients have joined this community and they want to help, okay, research. So as an example of what they can do, I show you this one. So this uh, is very pale, but this is the scheme of the gene, okay, with all the mutations that we know so far. And I want to point out that below is what is published. So we have few reports uh, with published cases, like the one I showed you before. And above is all that is still unpublished, but that we know for the, from the families, because they sent me and to my collaborators the genetic reports of the kids, uh, uh, the symptoms, they tell us how they are, what they do, and so on. So actually, for rare diseases, uh, what you see in the literature is the tip of the iceberg, because we know that there is much, much more. The problem is to find it out. <laughs> you know, to talk to the people and say, can you do one to help? Can you give me details, of course, uh, with all the regulations of privacy that you can imagine. So first thing, uh, especially for rare diseases, patients are, the, you know, the starting point. Then, uh, what can you do <laughs> with all the data? So patients are also important because uh, you can use patient-derived material. And one of the things that you can do is to use patient-derived fi fibroblasts. So in this case, the patient uh, goes to, mm, to the hospital, to the clinician that follows him or her, and agrees, of course, upon you know, signed consent and everything to give a little biopsy of the skin mm, uh, to the right fibroblast. And of course, you need them from the patients, you need them from control subject. Uh, the best would be um, some of the family, which is not affect who is not affected. If that is not possible, you try to match for age and sex, at least. Okay, so we have fibroblasts from the real people, okay, that we can grow in the lab. So this is a neurological disorder. So fibroblasts are not neurons, this is very clear, but still there are many, many useful information that you can get from the fibroblasts of the patients because there are some basic uh, cellular processes that are common to all cells that happens in neurons, in the skin, everywhere, that you can already study at this stage. Okay, so these are already extremely useful by themselves. But then, what you can do, you can um, de-differentiate de them and transform fibroblasts into pluripotent stem cells. This is now routine, well, not super routine, but quite a routine technique, okay? We know how to do it. In a, this, this is a protocol that lasts days, two weeks, and you can basically transform fibroblasts into pluripotent stem cells. For example, this we do in collaboration with some clinicians, the group of Dr. Santorelli at the Fondazione Stella Maris in Pisa, okay? So what you get is from the skin of the patients, you get pluripotent stem cells. And here, again, they are not neurons, but extremely useful because they are pluripotent, so they can be differentiated in potentially any type of cell, or mature cells, but also they reflect early stages of development. So these are very useful because they can give us information of what happens to the patients during the development, the prenatal development, okay? So already, again, they are not neurons, but many, many important information can be extracted already working on these cells. Last, of course, uh, we are neuroscientists, we want neurons in the end, so there are protocols to uh, push pluripotent stem cells to differentiate into neurons. So you see, I put here, these are a bit longer, so you need weeks, months uh, to get from stem cells to neurons, but there are now, uh, there are several protocols that are in use and uh, um, they are feasible, so they are accepted already by the community. So once you have your difference, also you can choose between different types of neurons, okay, but this is, you know, a bit too much detail for now. But in the end, you can obtain the human neurons in your dish through this uh, sequential, let's say, protocol. And from here, there's plenty you can do because you can start, remember, these neurons carry the very same mutation that the patient has. So you can study how they grow, how they mature, how they talk to each other. There is really plenty you can do on, those, on this model. 
So this is an extremely useful model. Of course, there's pros and cons. There is no perfect model, this is for sure. Um, why is this so useful? Why do I like it in particular? First, we can study human neurons. Of course, maybe you are all familiar with the rodents, so we can study mouse neurons, rat neurons very well. They are very similar to human, but they're not human neurons. And there is no other way, of course you cannot take neurons from the brain of people, okay? This is not something we would like to do. Well, in principle we would like, but we cannot do it, okay? So if you want to see a human neuron in your, under your microscope, that's more or less the only way to do it. And this is very important. Uh, also, we talk about neurons, but we are also glial cells in the brain that can be studied in the same way, okay? So this is extremely powerful model, and it is a platform you can use, for example, for drug screening, but this time you screen on human cells, which have the pathogenic mutation. So you can understand this is powerful, okay? Uh, last but not least, uh, there is no animal experimentation involved, which is also a sensitive topic, you know, when you talk about biomedical research. Uh, cons. Well, before getting to what I wrote, of course, you have neurons in a dish. And the neuron in a dish is human, is nice, but it's not like a neuron within a brain, okay? So still, of course, there are limitations, okay? Uh, second limitation, you obtain a line from a patient. So that cell line is perfect for that patient, but as we mentioned before, uh, you can have one gene per patient. So how much can we then extrapolate from this one cell line to all the patients uh, with that pathology? This is another problem. Uh, we can, to some extent, okay, definitely we can, but we always have to keep this in mind. Also, this is a bit of technical problem, but this is a, a bit of a technical workshop. So also there is a problem of what to use as a control. Why? Because we're all very different as human beings, one from the next. So yeah, maybe one person carries the pathogenic mutation, which is of course the pathogenic mutation, but then all the other genes may contribute. We may have a, a multifactorial, so, they are co so there are genes that may not be mutated, but they may contribute to the pathology. So if I take a, a healthy random control, okay, this, it does not have the mutation, but what about all the other genes? Okay, we don't know, we are all different. So this is another problem, what do I compare these cells to, to be really sure of what I see? So there is an answer to this question. I think this is a half scientific audience, so you may have heard of the CRISPR technique, have you? Some of you, yes, most of you, fantastic. So you know what it is. No, but I tell you for people who don't. So uh, this is a, a technique that is now on the newspaper as well, okay? So this allows precise gene editing. So example, you take the cell from one patient, you treat them, you know, you, uh, you subject them to this technique and you can revert the single mutation to wild type, okay? Let's say there is one base that is different. You engineer the system so that it takes the, the wrong base and put it back to normal. So now you have the perfect control where only that gene is different, not mutated or not mutated, and everything else is the same. That's the perfect, it's called isogenic control, and that's what we all would like to have, ideally to study. Little problem, it's extremely expensive. <laughs> I mean, this is a problem, okay, because we have to get money to, get, to do these things. So this goes between 20, to do it on one cell line, you need, uh, if you are lucky, 20, if not 30,000 euros, okay? Just to get the cells, okay? I think this is also important to discuss, because when people say, okay, research needs money, you know, this is a very good example. You want to do this because you have the cells, you have the patient, but you don't have the money, so you're stuck, okay? So this is the perfect system, but, uh, you know, not all laboratories can afford it. So then, that's why we use uh, controls that are not perfect, but, you know, we, we don't live in a perfect world, okay? Yeah. Done. So this was just, uh, um, I say, um, one technique that we can use that I try to, you know, explain in the good and the bad side. So the take-home message that I would like to leave is first, when you study genetic disease, 
you have to be in very strict contact with patients for several reasons, but mostly because uh, they can provide you information and material that otherwise is still not in the literature, and this is crucial. And second, you can also work with patient-derived material, provided you follow, you know, certain protocols and certain rules that have to be really, really strict. So this is the last, and this stresses again the, my acknowledgement slide that this is a um, network um, effort because you need the preclinical, you need the clinical, you need the patients, and you need the money. If you get all of these, then probably you can keep going and, and do something useful. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Fabrizia. And now we will immediately uh, give the word to Matteo Rossi Sebastiano from Torino, from the University of Torino, that will bring us to the in, the in silico world. Please. All right, so thank you, Gabriele. Um, I think my presentation is not on, or is it? Well, it's taking a while to load, I guess. I think it's taking a while to be loaded. Okay, yeah. All right, here we are. So thank you very much. Um, so when I was asked to, to choose the title uh, for, for, the pres for this presentation, I came up with uh, biotech medicinal chemistry and uh, rare diseases, hybrid approaches. So maybe the word hybrid is more focused on the technical part. As you can see here, we have some uh, pictures, some beautiful uh, <laughs> images uh, of uh, neurons and some mice, and on the other hand, we have some drugs. But as it was already stressed before by the, by the other speakers, uh, uh, the concept that I would like to convey is that uh, collaborative efforts, so uh, in synthesis, building up some uh, bridges between different expertise domains is the key, and especially in the case of rare diseases. Uh, why that? Uh, because when we talk about common diseases, uh, we normally have uh, bigger patient cohorts. Uh, they are a dimensionally relevant uh, population issue. So if you think about the first three disease-related causes of death, uh, well, in my mind come for sure cancer, uh, diabetes, uh, heart failure, and uh, of course like those are perceived by the population and by the society. Uh, in some cases, uh, there, are also, uh, there is also a more homogeneous population of patients, and this makes those pathologies for sure not easy, but at least easier to be studied. And then a, a sort of virtuous circle is established in this contest because uh, uh, big pharma companies and academia perform preliminary experiments which generate value, which get translated uh, into funding, or brutally said, money, which fosters then uh, as said before, it's needed, which fosters then the research forward. But in this, uh, no, for sure not perfect system, but at least working system, um, when we talk about rare and ultra rare diseases, uh, the situation is a bit different. This circle is broken uh, because, uh, as uh, Professor Ceska said before, um, there are a few scattered patients, they are often misdiagnosed, and also the heterogeneity for some cases is really high. Imagine again that in some cases we have one mutation which is typical of one single patient. And so in the end we find ourselves in a situation whereby personalized uh, medicine is needed more, more than ever. And of course we lack what we basically all lack in our life, time and money. Um, so is there a way to solve this challenge of improving the efficiency of a drug discovery process? And how can, can we do that in a in a, by, by cutting some corners, but by still, of course, uh, take, uh, keeping, uh, keeping the quality of the process. So here I have a scheme, I, I won't go into details, but let's say that we start from a target validation, so identifying a specific mechanism in a pathology and finding the way through the patient bedside to then treat the patient. So a uh, first strategy, which is uh, especially useful when we want to, to cut corners in this case, is to do a drug uh, repositioning strategy. So uh, taking a drug which has been approved for a certain therapeutic indication, and in the best case, landing to an off-label approval or a second therapeutic indication approval. So treat the patient with the same drug which has already been survived all the uh, safety uh, trials. Uh, it's been already be proved to be safe and efficient, and therefore 
the process gets shorter and for sure costs less money. But also on the technical viewpoint, we can have some techniques which help us uh, shortening the whole process. In terms of target validation, we see the rise of bioinformatics, or at least we have seen that in the last uh, 20 years, meaning uh, analyzing data, usually genomic and transcriptomic data were already there, um, to, to prune out information that otherwise wouldn't be available in a very efficient way. But uh, as well as Professor Cesca said before, one can choose to go for simple cell models, such as patient-derived fibroblasts, for proof of concept uh, experiments. Um, also, another important point that I would like to stress is that uh, usually when one does a drug design, one needs to know the structure of the target, and the target is usually a protein, so the three-dimensional structure of the protein. And uh, to solve the 3D structure of a protein experimentally it takes a lot of money and a lot of times, but there are computational techniques nowadays who are, which are particularly effective and, uh, and quite fast, I would say, to predict such structures. Then uh, the heat identification, so the identification of a first molecule binding the target and working, um, can be done uh, through an in silico screening as well. So also here we say that the calculation can help us before going to the lab and doing experiments. And also the optimization, the subsequent optimization can be aided by, by computation. And I won't talk about that uh, in a deeper way, but we've seen the rise as well of in silico clinical trials, meaning that we need smaller patient cohorts to test several, uh, uh, to test the deficiency of, uh, of uh, the efficacy, pardon, of several drugs by the aid of uh, generating virtual patients. But after this, uh, this short introduction, I would like to actually uh, tell you a case application of this hybrid approach to an HSP form, so an hereditary spastic uh, uh, par uh, paraplegia form called infantile ascending hereditary spastic paraplegia, or in short, YASP. Um, YASP is a disease deriving from mutation to the gene ALS2, which codes for a protein called alcin. When such mutations, uh, misensory dysfunction in any way, occur, there is an upper motor neuron defect and thus impair the ambulation. How did we come to do research about, uh, about this pathology? Uh, well, we got in, in contact with, uh, with Olivia, or Oli. She's a young uh, YASP patient, now she's six, and she got an early YASP diagnosis. And the uh, genetic analysis revealed that uh, she has two, she harbors two mutations. So here we have the scheme of uh, the coding region of the gene, and uh, one mutation is a truncation here at this level, while we have a missense mutation uh, at this level. What does it mean? It means that basically the truncation uh, is basically the, the formation of a stop codon which exits uh, in uh, nonsense mediated decay, meaning that there is no protein. So no protein of no alcin protein gets translated from this allele. While the missense mutation is the substitution of uh, an amino acid with another one, specifically an arginine to a tryptophan in position 611. Um, what was known when we encountered this patient case uh, about alcin and about YASP? Quite a lot at the biochemical level, not so much about the structural level. Uh, we know from previous studies uh, from uh, a Japanese group that uh, alcin to be active needs to tetramerize, meaning assemble in quadruplets, and that this happens by first forming dimers, so pairs interacting through the C-terminal domain, this blue part schematized here, and then the formation of a tetramer by the interaction of two dimers. But structural information, again, was not available because the protein structure had not been solved. So how could we fill this uh, molecular gap to try to repurpose or anyway design the novel, any drug? Then here, a computational tool, which is pretty popular nowadays, came to our help. So uh, a Google consociate, uh, DeepMind, had developed uh, AlphaFold2 a couple of years ago, which is an AI-based system for the prediction of protein structures. And through that, we could obtain quite a nice structure of alcin here depicted. And by coupling this approach with another computational technique called protein-protein docking, we could obtain a first model of the tetramer, of the alcin tetramer, with molecular detail, which seemed to be pretty reasonable and respect all the biochemical constraints derived from the literature. So at this point, we know how 
wild types of how physiological, let's call it normal, alsin works, the real question is, what about in the case of Olli? Uh, with her mutation, the one that, of course, forms the protein, so the missions one, uh, we came to understand that basically uh, her alsin is forming a pathologic dimer. So, as you can see here, we have a blue and a green domain schematized interacting with each other and that this conformation is not allowing the formation of the active tetramer. So basically, alsin is not active because it assembles in a non-physiological way. Uh, we did pretty advanced simulation, I won't go into details uh, because of that, but uh, for instance, this is a snapshot of a technique called molecular dynamics which allows to simulate what's happening in reality, let's say, so a solution with different proteins in their interaction and see how their behavior. So we got quite a lot of computational data proving our theory, but we still needed to prove it. But before showing you that, uh, um, let's say that we face a situation whereby we had uh, depicted the structure of the protein alsin and we have depicted the structure of the mutant protein alsin in the patient case. Uh, here, for instance, I'm drawing a surface. We see that we have uh, the positively charged arginine residue, which is colored in blue. This depiction is depending on the partial elect electrostatic charge. Well, here we have a tryptophan, the mutant residue, which is in white because it's neutral and lipophilic. So there is a total change of partial charge and the deriving properties. And then we wondered, would that be a good pharmacological strategy to find any molecule that binds this residue here and sits such a scarf, schematizing it, hiding the pathologic dimer responsible for the formation of the abnormal dimer and therefore the inactivation of the protein. Uh, we developed that in, uh, in Turin in the biotechnology department. We performed a uh, uh, virtual screening, which is also another pretty interesting technique because one can, with a calculator, come to with some molecule uh, that seem to have a particular, particularly favored affinity for a specific target. And we individuated that certain vitamin K derivatives, which are already approved for another therapeutic indication, are effectively predicted to serve to the purpose. We then contacted the, the Japanese group of Professor Shinji Adano at the University of Tokai, who's an expert about alsin, and he had a model expressing exactly our mutation, and so he tested the vitamin K derivatives on the model, proving at the biophysical level that effectively it can shift the balance towards the formation of tetramers again. Then with some collaborators uh, in Turin, we extracted skin fibroblast from uh, the patient. And here, that's when I came to Trieste because we established a collaborator with uh, Professor Cesca and Professor Bai. And here we wanted to get a readout, in a functional readout, a way to monitor the pathology and the fact that we could observe at the functional level and see whether the drug was able to correct it. So a marker, basically. Since the literature was linking the mechanism of alsin to mitochondria, we developed a, a pipeline here uh, in Trieste at the life science department, which basically is based on a staining with a specific mitochondrial dye, evidence in the mitochondria. In a quite uh, high throughput way, we managed to analyze images like those, and Professor Bai will talk about it uh, uh, later in a more approfundated way for sure. And um, we managed also in batch to reconstruct uh, the three-dimensional network of mitochondria because when we think about mitochondria in textbook, we see some small beans, but effectively they are a network in some cases, okay, and uh, we evaluated uh, quite a lot of uh, morphological parameters and uh, interestingly we came to, observe, to the observation that uh, YASP fibroblast compared to control fibroblasts tend uh, to be a bit thicker and in literature this is correlated usually with uh, suffering mitochondria and not so efficient mitochondria. But even more interestingly, when we administered uh, the drug to the fibroblast, we could see that we can effectively revert the situation here, proving that there is a little effect uh, of the drug that we, have, uh, that we have repurposed. So to make a long story short, uh, imagine that uh, a drug discovery project is about 
10, 15 years, in a couple of years we came from a patient diagnosis to an experimental preliminary verification, but this was enough for the medical committee to get uh, um, compassionate use approval. So the patient is currently intaking vitamin K uh, based on those data, but of course uh, we will deepen our knowledge about this pathology later. I'm just concluding uh, with this slide, uh, I won't comment it all, but uh, I've shown you that uh, one can use uh, several uh, AI-based tools uh, to make some uh, predictions which can turn useful. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, we are not uh, the only one having these ideas, and as you can see here in this slide, we have quite a lot of names from big tech. So, the idea that one can pull out quite a lot of interesting information from what's already out there, uh, it's already running around and uh, companies with quite a lot of resources are developing really interesting tools. So it's a beautiful time to do research into and uh, I think in the field of rare diseases whereby maybe resources are a bit scarcer, well, uh, I think there can be a great benefit. Uh, with that, I come to the acknowledgement. Uh, just in short, I would like uh, to thank uh, my supervisors in Turin, Professor Caron Endermondi, but especially Professor Cesca, Professor Bay, and Professor Don Giorgi from the University of Trieste. Because of the collaboration that we have established, they hosted me and yeah, allowed uh, all of us to get these nice results. So, and especially the, um, as well the Trieste Next organization and all of you. So, thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you. So, thank you to all the speakers. I will be really short, uh, really brief uh, with my part of presentation to allow uh, as much as possible your question and your discussion with uh, our pool of experts. So, my part of the presentation will be focused uh, on more on a technological point of view. Because uh, when I came out with the title, with the idea of the 21st century, then I realized that we, uh, we still need to get improving technology and biotechnology. In particular, something that uh, is really, uh, we really would like to point out is that uh, we are human, we like to see things. We like to understand things looking at them. And in fact, uh, microscopy, is really the techniques that make arising biology. Cellular biology came from the first one looking throughout the lens and seeing, oh, this looks like cell. Okay, they were cell core, they were not cells, they were hole in the cork. But in, in any case, they called cell this, and now we all study cellular biology due to this paper from 350 years ago. So, clearly, and why this in the 21st century? Because we, we want to see more and we want to see better. Clearly, for that reason, now that biotechnologies are really on the, on the edge of what is the, uh, the, in this century and what we need to, uh, to do to address all possible challenge, we, we need a lot of uh, new technological advancement. We have a lot of new technological advancement that a lot of people don't know yet about. Uh, in particular, uh, right now, microscopy technology already played a crucial role in the development, in all the discovery that were uh, showed today by a colleague, and the instrumental exploring in the last few uh, the, in the last few years, in the last ten years, we already got about three. No, not we, the microscopy world already got three Nobel Prize for uh, for their important contribution in the research field, either in physics, in chemistry, or in medicine. But they were all uh, focused on the on the microscopy. I want to point out that really one of these Nobel Prize, the one shared by Hell and Betzig, is on the advent of the super resolution microscopy that really changed the, changed the game and brought back microscopy on, as a, on, the, on, let's say, on the table of the techniques that needs to be used to understand and needs to be used to, uh, to, uh, to better uh, aid in drug discovery and to allow scientists to see things happening in lifetime, in, in real time, okay? Uh, one thing that I would like to point out is really, is, okay, it's great to use microscopy for new, future challenging problem. We are still deal with a lot of past problem. Let's say about here is an example of asbestos, okay? Thanks, visualized through an electron, uh, scanning electron microscope. Clearly, this is one big problem for the society of, uh, for at, le at least for the Western society where our parents used a lot of asbestos to to seal our houses and to make houses uh, in their uh, idea more sure, 
fire retardant, resistant, uh, great properties, cancerogenic. So now we need to understand where is and how to get to deal with that. And other things, guess what is this? This is our uh, not friendly companion of the last three years. These yellow spots are SARS-CoV-2. SARS so the ones that uh, brought us to be masked uh, as in a party for the last two years or three years, so quite a long party given to this. And these are all visualized thanks to the microscope. At least, let me say that at least the microscopy picture at, at least allow us to say to all the um, people not believing in the virus that something was existing. Then clearly, if you don't want to believe it, you don't believe it even seeing it, but at least we were able to show something. Now, what we use in the world of microscopy, we used to see, as demonstrated by Matteo, to go to see, thanks to super-resolution microscopy, even really small structure in single cells. This is one of the fibroblasts from the, uh, from the patient. And, uh, but we also, now with uh, new techniques and with uh, the super-resolution microscopy, we are moving from the, let's say, classical fluorescent microscopy, which is already a pretty powerful techniques, but was a 20th century technique, to super resolve the image that right here with such a light you cannot really appreciate, but you have to manage that each of these single spots represent a synaptic button. So one of the points that uh, allow our neurons to speak each other's, to collect information, to store information, and see them well means counting them well, means uh, understanding them well, what they're doing and how they behave in a pathological condition comparing a, an healthy condition. Uh, we are now approaching, thanks to the new, a real new uh, challenge of the microscopy world, is looking in a deep imaging. Uh, all of us played with a, with a small microscope, either at home, at school, whatever, and, you know, slides are single plane. We were used to see things on a single plane. We are not bidimensional, we are three-dimensional, generally. So, now, we, a lot of effort was pushed to bring a microscope, the ability, to see deep into the tissue, to understand uh, this new protocol of techniques like creating organoids, creating a uh, sphere of cells that makes them grow them into a three-dimensional ambience, allow us to better study pathology in a more physiological system without using animals. And again, this is a great tool to reduce, strongly reduce the number of animals that needs to be used in the biomedical research. Now, you have to consider that also the, we'll say, the long-lasting technique or uh, old technique like uh, electron microscopy, if, I, if my colleague uh, say that I'm saying old technique, they will kill me, but uh, uh, they receive in the last uh, uh, 10 years a really strong push with new, incredibly expensive and incredibly uh, powerful upgrade. So now new scanning electron microscope and new transmission electron microscope are really able to provide us an incredible resolution evidence of, uh, of the world. These are uh, cells growing on nanofibers. Thinking about uh, the world of right now, maybe some of you heard about Neuralink uh, or interaction between uh, chips in the brain, interaction between biomaterials and cells. You wanna know, you wanna see uh, what's happened to these cells once they sit on uh, these nanomaterials that is not generally present in our, in our brain and now you can see it. This is something just more classical, but it's great to see, to see them in resolution. This is a blood cloth. When we make a, a cut, all you see, all these uh, small uh, bubbled sphere are platelets, activated platelets. You see some erythrocytes, some red blood cells closed in the network, and clear, this is a classical picture that is taken when you want to have to study some form of hemophilia or you have to study uh, drugs that are important to avoid the formation of cloth, like in the case of, uh, um, of uh, ictus or possible uh, brain stroke and so on. You want to prevent them using the right drugs and you can verify them using this kind of technique. Again, you can see the same cells you see before in fluorescence from the patient uh, from Turin, this was shown here in electron microscopy showing single structure, single really mitochondria, lysosome, accumulates of some things that we are still dealing with them, we are still studying them, but these kind of things 
we were unable to see with the classical light microscopy. Now we see them with electron microscopy. In conclusion, we can go also in the, in the natural world. These are algae. Some of them are natural algae presence in our sea. Some of them are new presence arriving from the rising of the temperature. These are a biomarker of what's going on in the nature. So microscopy is incredibly used also for the description of the big world. You think about global changing and you go looking to something that is two micron uh, thick to understand if our sea is getting tropicalized or not and how fast is getting tropicalized. You can verify this looking to these kind of elements which represent the first, I would say, one of the first step of the, of the chain, of the heating chain that we have uh, of the different uh, uh, world outside. Okay, so in conclusion, these are classic another um, analysis that we generally do in, at the University at the Chima at the center of uh, uh, micro advanced microscopy are pollen. Again, pollen can arrive from, uh, let's say, regular uh, classical plants that our parents and grandparents were used to have or can came from plants that were not used to be around uh, 20, 30 or 50 years ago. In conclusion, microscopy, even looking in the small, and the small field is essential to unveil in the world and will be more and more essential in the, first, in the 21st century. It's now offer really unprecedented uh, capability and possibility going in 3D, going in, uh, in deep imaging, going with resolution that were just a dream a couple of decades ago. So we, have, we need to expand and to invest in this kind of world, clearly our strong investment that we are doing in connection with other groups, with other university, with other, for instance, right now, the center was also financed by the region, the uh, Friuli Venezia Giulia region, thanks to the acquisition of two, three important machines. So clearly, uh, that's, uh, that's an important point because this machine needs to be shared. No, there is no more the scientist uh, going in his own laboratory and using his own microscope. These kind of microscope are, are so big and so important, so expensive to be maintained that are every time shared machine. Also because often the, the scientist having the idea is, is quite rarely the one able to make run the microscope. Okay, so for, from this uh, I will just a couple of pictures of what, are, what I'm talking about because often people just don't know what, what it looks like an electron microscope or a regular optical microscope, and with this I will stop allowing all of you to ask uh, to all the uh, guests and all the speakers your question. okay? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you for your great talks, and I have a question for uh, Professor Ceska, and uh, hi. Um, like uh, in particular, I was wondering, so uh, HSP so has many mutations, so uh, I was wondering what, like uh, the reason why you choose to study that specific gene, if it's maybe correlated with its I don't know, drug ability or there is other um, biological uh, reasons uh, and uh, also uh, if you have any clue on uh, uh, how can you possibly uh, treat patients that are specifically affected by that uh, mutation. Yeah, so thank you for this question. This is a question that I like because I started studying this gene much, much before it was associated to any pathology. So I was uh, swimming in that basic research that no one cared about. <laughs> and I started studying this gene because the laboratory that I joined for my PhD had just cloned it and they wanted to know more. But they wanted to know more because of scientific curiosity, basically. We had the suspicion that it could be linked to diseases, but at the time, 20 years ago. <laughs> At the time, there was no associated disease. So I can say that for quite a few years, I went on with the models to understand it. Um, and that was basic uh, interest and basic research. Only at some point, actually, I was ready to, you know, not give up, but leave it on the side, because at some point, uh, only 
Unfortunately, basic science is, is not funded a, a lot, so I was ready to move to some related issues with more perspective. But at that point, I was lucky because that's when the first papers come, came out uh, with the patients, and then everything got an entirely new perspective. So the reason why I'm studying this is a bit of serendipity, if you want. But then, at the time, uh, I became suddenly one of the three people in the world knowing what that protein was all about. And then I said, I cannot give up now. <laughs> and so this is why then now I'm, I keep going. Yes, I have ideas about how we can treat it, but this is when the in silico strategy would come really useful because we, we know that neurotrophins pathway play a role, so we have some candidate pathways. And, but before starting to treat cells with random drugs, we are plan what we are planning to do is exactly this in silico analysis to restrict uh, you know, the, uh, the possible candidates so that when we move to real cells, uh, then we have a you know, ma manageable uh, prospect you know, to study. Yes, thank you. But thank you. This is a, an important question. And so first of all, thank you for the great talk. I think it showcased one beautiful side of science, which is the complementations when different fields of science come together to face a common issue, in this case diseases. I have two questions in mind. The first one um, is aimed towards the female professors. Um, I would like to know what is your take on gene therapy for genetic diseases? Okay, well, I guess it's the, the starting point for gene therapy was really to focus on um, how genetic diseases could be treated basically and simply by replacing the gene that is mutated or dysfunctional by bringing new genes, uh, well, new synthetic gene uh, to, to the patient. So this is really what started the field and where all the effort has been, uh, has been uh, put. What is quite interesting is that uh, this uh, uh, theme uh, has been also growing during the years with the addition of new technology. Uh, Professor Cheska talked about CRISPR-Cas9, which uh, really was like a, a kind of... Uh, uh, feu d'artifice in the, in the science world uh, with a technology that is uh, so much, uh, uh, has so much hope for, for bringing personalized medicine and specifically target genes uh, that are dysfunctional. So combining the approaches by uh, what has been developed to use specific tools to bring uh, genes uh, in specific uh, um, organs that are sometimes difficult to, uh, to reach and also specific tools to really uh, at the genetic level uh, modify, replace or even stop the expression of, of some genes. Uh, we, we said it uh, in different ways but I guess we all come to the conclusion that those diseases, um, they are multifactorial most of the time. Even though it seems that one gene is involved, the environment has to be taken into account. And by using multi, uh, multidisciplinary approach, um, that's, that is something that uh, uh, could, um, could lead to, uh, I guess, uh, tr good treatments. Could I maybe add, um, does a multifactorial base disease require multifactorial treatment as well? Definitely, and I, I, I would come back to a uh, kind of theme during the presentation uh, about brain diseases, and we know that uh, unfortunately most of those diseases are due to uh, different factors uh, or will trigger uh, different uh, consequences that won't be able to, to be uh, answered and treated by one approach. Uh, just, uh, we talked about uh, uh, seeing, but uh, for the brain, the clinician has to see where, where he goes or where she goes. 
uh, has to see the, the area that are, that are targeted and that are dysfunctional. And so also we talk about drugs, but uh, uh, we have to have the tools that uh, will uh, allow the clinician to, to be uh, safe in the handling of the patient or bring the drugs. So it's uh, really a combination of all of that uh, that would be able to allow us to treat uh, multifactorial uh, diseases. Thank you. Um, so the, my second question uh, relates to the more bioinformatic side of things. I think coming back to the beauty of science, um, we see more and more that bioinformatics is actually the, the tying force between the different fields of science. I think that's incredible because it's shortcutting the whole process of medical intervention and discovery by a lot. So my question would be, what were the recent inventions and methods in bioinformatics which we use nowadays in the last couple, five years? And what are the requirements to actually get to use this type of technology in terms of education, uh, cost, computational science, this side of things? Thank you. All right, so thank you for your questions. I mean. In the first part, you really nailed down what's really happening. Like, since experiments cost basically more money and time than computations, who also have costs, of course, but maybe in a minor fashion, uh, the workflow of science is getting more like uh, you direct, you make informed choices, let's say, based upon uh, predictions. Uh, Concerning bioinformatics itself, uh, I think uh, I cannot comment myself about the most recent inventions. Uh, I would say up to now, uh, I would say that alpha missions is the thing that uh, just uh, struck me the most. Um, in terms of, in, in, on the other hand, because one has to distinguish uh, about molecular modeling, so we don't talk genes, we don't talk expression profiling anymore. We talk about protein structures and maybe protein drug interaction or drug drug interactions. Well, there has been uh, huge amounts uh, in a, it's a more of an informatic question, but it has reflections on, uh, on the modeling as well in uh, multi parallel processing. So, tools uh, such as molecular dynamics, which were like in the 80s uh, just more theoretical and then in the 2000s just like small theoretical exercise to see oh that's so nice we see how the ethane is behaving um, now with multiple parallel processing units uh, heavily relying uh, uh, on GPUs by the way and uh, there is also there the challenge to cope with the shortage of such materials they have made huge progresses and uh, also the computation power is more and more shared like uh, like in Italy we have the Cineca, in the Nordic countries they have uh, Fuzu in um, Finland, in the US they have everything because they always have everything of course <laughs> and uh, so uh, and those resources are, are more and more shared so that's for sure one technology which is strongly advancing uh, AlphaFold. Uh, so how everything belonging to the family of uh, the employment of uh, modern artificial intelligence to solve this type of problems. I think it's, uh, I'm really, I'm really thrilled to see what, what will happen. Regarding the part about what's your background, uh, again, uh, I can give you my answer that's surely non-canonical. Uh, <laughs> because I'm a pharmacist, uh, I have a PhD in biomedical sciences, so some parts I had basically to, to learn through experience by doing research, research but I would say having a broader approach so you also are not uh, technically skilled about to use these tools but you also know where to apply them within a research process, I would privilege this approach. So do not study informatics. That's at least my advice uh, which is truly personal if you want to do this. If you want to do informatics, that's another thing. Uh, I think a general biology or chemistry background is more suited for that uh, and that one can specialize. I think that's, uh, that's more or less uh, the approach. Of course, like a bit of coding, a bit of programming one needs to have, but that's 
education that at this level can be acquired later. Consider also that uh, most of the pipelines now rely on Python libraries, which is anyway a high level uh, coding language, so you are not required to program in assembly or so on. Just add, I will just comment a brief one. I would add, I would have a look more on the, uh, as was suggested, on course with a broad uh, approach, not directly, uh, okay, there are great courses related to data analysis, but it's really important to see uh, to what kind of, because it's a, it's a universe. So wh where you wanna address uh, your, your points. So clearly either you go to biology course, technology course with, with a shared, uh, with some course in computational and whatever, but knowing how you can uh, use them is the, is the best approach probably. Was just uh, advice that we ran out of time. So uh, you thank you to all of you to be here. And so uh, hopefully enjoy the rest of the of the next. Uh, and uh, well, you will find also thanks to the uh, to the um, to the streaming and whatever all the email. If you have doubts or curiosity, you are definitely free to contact any of us uh, for your question or curiosity. Okay. Thank you again. Bye.